we are here today at the Highlands Ranch Library. It is Friday, June 3rd, 2022. My name is Mark Stevenson. I'm here with the Highlands Ranch Historical Society. And my guest today to share some thoughts of his time in Highlands Ranch is Steve Ormiston. Ormiston. I always like you to pronounce your name the right time. Steve, tell us a little bit about your history, where you were born, how long you've been here in Colorado. Um, thank you for the opportunity today. It's a real honor to visit with you. Um, You're welcome. I was born, uh, actually I was born in, in Washington State in a town called Wenatchee. Wenatchee is the apple capital of the world. That was its distinction. And is it, that near Hood Valley? I'm not familiar with that. Hood Valley? Um, no, not that, I'm not familiar with that. But anyway, it's over the Cascades, so it, it was very arid, as Colorado is, so I had familiar, familiarity with that. It, I lived there for five years until my father uh, decided to pack up the family and moved to California, uh, to Santa Barbara. They had visited Santa Barbara and thought, what a lovely place to go. Um, and my, my elder brothers at that time were um, in, in, in high school. So this was a major uprooting for them. But at age five, I hadn't started school. In fact, my first day of school was in Santa Barbara. So I lived a good part of my life, beginning age five, in Santa Barbara. And the irony is, is I thought that every place in the world was like California, you know, in terms of beauty and climate and all of this. And so I was very myopic at that time. But What did your father do? So my father was in real estate. Uh, he originally was in the agriculture with uh, apples, <laughs> uh, cold storage, in fact. And he uh, decided to take some resources that he had and investors thought highly of his skills and he became uh, a real estate investor, his own capital as well as that of others. And he primarily built apartments and um, some motels. He was at the ground floor of the beginning of the chain Motel 6, which was established there. And the first Motel 6, believe it or not, was on the beach in Santa Barbara. We'll leave the light on for you. Exactly, exactly. Um, great campaign, I thought. And my first paycheck <laughs> is from Travelodge, or excuse me, from, from uh, Motel 6. What age was that? Um, 12, I think, you know. So um, as, I, as I reflect on those years, uh, it was, again, it's a great place to live, etc. But with his, you know, tagging along with my father, as, as I might, um, it was a, a situation where I went to the job site a lot. So I saw construction. And over the dinner table he would um, recant some of his daily uh, real estate investment, um, you know, details of how he did it and what happened, what he had to do. So I was aware from an early age of what it took to develop. And I come by my love of design um, and architecture in, in particular is a passion for me. Uh, I come by that honestly because my uncle, who I admired deeply, uh, was an architect and quite a um, uh, man that was uh, ahead of his time. He created wonderful, beautiful um, buildings. His house in particular was... Was he from California as well? He lived in, in um, Yakima, Washington. Okay. So again, my origin is Washington and many of my relatives uh, are from there. We were the, <laughs> the black sheep of the family, the renegades that left to go to California. Everybody loved visiting us, but they would never live there. <laughs> but think about this. We moved in the 50s. He involved in real estate. I mean, you, it doesn't get any better than that because f real estate in the 50s, people were just discovering California. People were discovering what it had to offer. And um, as the uh, post-war, as, the, as the, the country became more affluent, people started, you know, investing in new homes, et cetera, et cetera, nationally. They, they thought this was a pretty attractive investment. And uh, the Giants and the Dodgers thought so. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so he was well-situated. And f 
frankly, he did re really well for himself. And as I said, the other investments that he had. And um, so it, it was a good life. It was a good childhood, really. And we traveled a lot. With having older brothers that graduated and started families of their own, I was essentially an only child. And we would go to lovely, lovely places. Palm Springs, I remember fondly of going there on weekends. And, and my mom and dad, you know, with a hectic, busy uh, schedule from work, they wanted to relax. So I, I got early on the, the, the innate need to just take time for yourself. And that's very important in life, I think. So I got to tag along. You went to high school in Santa Barbara? I did, um, San Marcos High School. And how did you pick the college that you ended up going to in Pomona? So in high school, I had a variety of shop classes. And one of those shop classes was uh, or mechanical drawing. And, and we actually did some drawing of buildings. And uh, I had, a, at that time, developed, as I said, a real interest in architecture, et cetera. So I applied at the universities that offered architecture, and coincidentally, my primary choice, choice was Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. That was my number one choice. My brother had gone there and successfully graduated, and they had a robust architectural school. Here's the interesting thing, and I also applied to the school I eventually went to, that's Cal Poly Pomona in, in, um, in the Los Angeles area. Um, they had a situation where architecture students were in a laboratory, laboratory setting. And they, they did that intentionally to have collaborative um, experiences in architecture. The problem was if the they didn't graduate enough seniors, then they had a limited space for their freshmen. And that's why I didn't get in. I was totally qualified. They simply didn't have room for me. So I, I took my second choice, and there again, I wasn't able to get into the School of Architecture. But I thought, well, urban planning might be a really good fit for me. Uh, when I learned that architecture required heavy emphasis on mathematics, I'm not good at math. Um, so how can I apply or become educated in the design field um, and still meet my needs? Um, so urban planning became, by default, by all these circumstances, my, my, my uh, line of education. And I, got an un I received an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in urban planning um, because I loved it so much as I got into it and I realized what was going on. As a footnote, I might point out, as I mentioned, I travel a lot with my parents. They relied on me to plan, here, there's that word again, travel. I would help say, well, here's what we need to see and do, and boy, did they love that. They didn't have to think about it. You know, tell, they relied on me. Tell me where we need to go, where we need to see. I loved it. And this was before the days of the internet. Well, exactly, yeah. So, very astute observation, thank you. And using today's vernacular, I had an innate sense of direction. I have a, a spatial awareness that I could go to a city I've never been to before and tell them, turn right. I had an internal GPS way back at age eight or 10 or 12, whenever. And so I, I was well aware of this gift I have and I, I use it every day still. And, and um, my wife relies on it when we're traveling because she, she has none of that. And, and God bless her, she, you know, that's fine. I have my gift, she has hers. Were there some examples of urban planning that inspired you to pick that career that you saw there close to where you lived in California? Well, before I give you the examples, let me, let me give you some foundational information, if I may, that, that uh, from an early age, I would uh, work with toys and be, uh, Lego, not Legos, at that time it was uh, wooden blocks, and I would create cities that I, you know, I wanted to understand even before I knew this was going to be a profession of mine, I wanted to understand how cities worked. Um, they, were fa they fascinated me. And then I thought, well, what can I do to make them better? Well, there's congestion, so okay, you widen the roads or you provide public transit. I didn't know that till later, but as a young man, I was fascinated how they function and, and what, what we needed to do. 
to make them better, more habitable. And um, so the examples I would say that, that, that really impress me, um, you know, are fundamentally some of the smaller uh, communities, but uh, nationally I was aware of some of the, the new towns, master plan communities around the country. And uh, California has a, a robust tradition of development using that technique. Not everywhere in the world is that the case, but, but California had the advantage of land um, and capital, fortunately, to build cities. And so places like Mission Viejo, and uh, at the time, Del Webb, because my parents were in, in the time of life where they were interested in maybe, whoa, what would it be like to live in a Del Webb retirement community? So again, I go with them as they, you know, examine that possibility for their lives. And so, I, again, I was repeatedly understanding what it was. And what appealed to me about master plan communities is a lot of the happenstance. The, I mean, people love cities that just evolve uh, without any thought to the future. So the Del Webb communities were an example for me of master plan communities, which by definition have pretty much everything and anything the people that live there want and need. Uh, in those examples, you know, active lifestyle was important. So they often had golf courses, they had recreation facilities, all targeted at their, that age group. So all of that became part of my outlook that I wanted to live in a place that had what I needed. Um, and so that, that was the origin of my interest in urban planning. So you went to undergraduate at yes. Pomona? Yes. And they had a graduate program as well? Yes, they did. What was the focus of that? The graduate program? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the focus there was to take what we learned as undergraduates and take it to the next level. We had opportunities to do our own uh, design projects and go out into the community and do things to, to help plan for hypothetically um, new downtown areas. So I recall doing land plans and, um, and, and working through entitlement process, all um, hypothetical, but still very informative. And working with a team of, of like-minded students was really help, helpful to me to understand the collaborative process. Did you have a thesis? Oh dear. Or something equivalent to that? I did. Well, hmm. It's a long time ago. I apologize. I don't know. That's oh, fine. Um, but, but again, it was a found... Oh, well, the point I, I think I'd like to make in that regard is that while I was... Every moment I was in um, graduate school, I was also working at a, at a planning office. Or, a, you know, in other words, I, I was practicing what I was learning. And I think as much as anything, what I learned there is many of my fellow students, in fact, most of them were not in that situation. They had not started their careers. And I would come to these classes and I, we would work in, in a group. And I had the, the flatter, I was flattered by other students say, well, the teacher said this, what is it really like? Um, gave me a big head, but I tell you, I, I was very gratified to know that what I was learning in the classroom can, in fact, be applied in the real world, but also the opposite is true. You can apply what the reality of the situation as opposed to book learning, mm -hmm. uh, and I could share that with fellow, fellow students, and honestly, at that time, I, I, I can recall a little spark there that, well, maybe I want to be a professor but I, I preferred to be a practitioner of planning. So what was our timetable here, mid-70s? Yes, um, so I, I graduated, hmm, 1974 was my undergraduate degree, um, and then my graduate degree, it, it was a two-year program, but I actually got my diploma for one reason or another in 1976. Okay, so your first job, in the full-time job in the real world was with whom? So my first real job, um, it, well, um, was with um, Orange County, California. Um, it's now called Public Works. At the time, it was the Orange County Environmental Management Agency because the embryonic environmental movement started then. 
And as a quick aside and footnote, I was living in Santa Barbara and uh, in 1969, I think, was one of the first major oil spills from offshore oil platforms. And so there was pollution on our beaches and then uh, um, environmental uh, advocate um, um, Ralph Nader actually spoke to an assembly at our high school to say this has got to stop, you know, and, and it was at that time, it was a very heady time. At that time, the environment movement was underway. So everybody was beginning to, to latch on to that concept. Today we call it sustainability, okay? So through the years, the same concept has had different names, rebranded, if you will. But uh, at that time, I mean, it, I had, all these things intersect to influence my life direction. Um, but that was a footnote. What was your original question? The question was your first job. Oh, I apologize. So environmental management agency. Mm -hmm. And hysterically, uh, what I could secure was a student professional aid. So, you know, I had my degrees, but I was able to do the planning, or at least one degree and able to do that. And it got my foot in the door and I got to see the inner workings of a county um, planning department and all the various entities that interact with it. Um, and by that example and that experience gave me a real sense for what, what might be my future. Um, I um, must say that it served me, that experience served me very, very well working for a private developer later on in life, whereas I could sit down with the government, if you will, across the table, and I understood implicitly what they wanted from the developer, what they wanted from me as a representative of the developer, so I can be empathic and sympathetic, and, and so I knew how to talk, planning talk, if you will, that they felt comfortable that I knew what I was talking about and I could have the desired result of my employer, that being an approval or whatever. So eventually you got hooked up with Jack Rowe. Correct. Uh, either in when he was partner of another company or when he formed his right. own company. Right. Um, and what did you do with Rob? What were your first type mm -hmm. of assignments? Mm -hmm. So just realizing you're newly graduated, right, right. <clears throat> limited experience in the real world. So, um, and again, I'm very proud of this. My first task was to prepare what was in California law, not national, but it eventually was national. Something called environmental impact report. Um, federal laws, environmental impact statement. They're very similar. Uh, and what they do are you prepare studies and analysis of the impact of new development on the environment. You know, again, there's this thread here of environment and conservation and, and then planning. And so it was a, a sweet spot for me. It fit beautifully and I love doing that. The consequence of that for my, um, my employer was, um, and I believe you've interviewed Jim Teffer. God bless Jim Teffer. Uh, he, he had nicknames for me um, because Which I, were? I, I might have been the antithesis of what he wanted to deal with as a developer and that's a classic view mm -hmm. of it. But, um, they were uh, gr a tree hugger and greenie. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I remember most. He didn't want to have to deal with, but he had to because it was law and it was regulation. But uh, he used to tease me about what I was doing on behalf of the company that was, you know, required. Um, and so that was that was kind of a fun anecdote. Did, and did you ever work him. with Jim? in his uh, life in California prior to coming out here? Um, I did anecdotally, but not, I wasn't of, of the caliber of uh, stature in the organization. I saw him and, and interacted with him only briefly, but uh, it became more and more evident as we moved to, to California, excuse me, to Colorado, because at the time we were a very small group uh, with, with one task, and that is to get Highlands Ranch zoned. In, in two year time. So 1978 roughly? Yes. Um, January. Mission Viejo who had, <clears throat> excuse me, started in California at a cattle ranch south of Los Angeles when the O'Neill family was of an age they were ready to sell. Mm -hmm. 
decided that they would sell a property twice as big out here in Colorado that had been privately owned by a family who then through some intermediaries put it up for sale. Mm -hmm. And Mission Viejo Company at this point took a flyer on that on an option to say let's see if this could be developed um, profitably at this point and started the process of putting together a development plan. What was your involvement in that? Realizing you worked at that time for Rob and you yes. were in California. Initially, yeah. Initially. We, so we, so tell the, me what the timetable is. Sure, sure. As, so January 1978 is the, the pivotal month, right? That's when the agreement you mentioned was signed and the president of, of Mission Viejo Company at the time, Phil Riley, had a, a press meeting and said, We're, we are Mission Viejo Company, we are from California, we're here to build a community for Colorado, and it's gonna be a satellite city. So he defined the concept uh, in a meeting early January, and that was before we came out. And I must step back one moment, if I may, to say that, okay, I'm heavily involved in Mission Viejo, California, which is now a city, it wasn't then, it's now a city. And I had the opportunity to work on that project, but I also had another opportunity, which is equally exciting, to, again, from the ground up, from day one, work on another master plan community in the vicinity of Mission Viejo. Aliso Viejo. Aliso Viejo. Yeah. And that was a very challenging project for a lot of reasons that uh, we'll, we'll not cover today. But uh, it gave me, again, confidence and understanding. And so the day that we got that approved, um, management came up to me and said, how would you like to move to Colorado? <laughs> um, I was 25 at the time and single and ready to buy a house. You know, So I had put money down on a house. So prior to that, I had, you know, this is my home. But I tell you, a 25-year-old, and you think, oh, well, I miss the beach. I really do, but Colorado mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and skiing, it was very tempting. So I leaped at it. I absolutely did. And well, the 70s was a decade of huge growth yeah. in Colorado. Yeah. But it was also, An opportunity. It was also the decade of don't Californicate Colorado. Right. It was, and, and as Governor so, Lamb and the Silver Stake through yeah. C four seventy and all those things, and as, and as we flew out in January to find a home to relocate, which we were given a weekend, and in less than twenty four hours, I bought a condo. Um, Are you married at that point? No, still single, and um, I mean, this is all the same month, and. Um, uh, so we had a clipping file of newspaper articles surrounding the speech I mentioned Mr. Riley did. And in that clipping file was a photograph. And in that photograph was a metal sign, which is now at the Highlands Ranch Mansion, a metal sign that has the words Highlands Ranch. And this was situated at County Line Road and Broadway, that T intersection at the time. And it had, in the picture you had to look at, it was kind of foggy, hung an effigy was a person, and the sign says, enter at your own risk, essentially, Mission Viejo, go home. So I started my first day of work, or, you know, essentially, with that in the back of my mind. So I, I knew we were not welcome, and... Challenging times. It was challenge, but I, I felt that I had to step up to that challenge, and I had to, and, and frankly, others saw that in me, that I have the ability to, be, to listen, I have the ability and skills to be kind and, and uh, um, you know, not tell people off if they have opinions different from mine or from my company. So I have this gift whereby I can make people calmly listen to what I'm saying and tell them what we're going to do and make commitments. We were in a big effort to demonstrate this is what we are doing. And Again, Colorado had this history, specifically Pueblo West, where Californians came in, sold land without any of the infrastructure, and left, left them high and dry. So this is the environment in which we entered Colorado. 
And because of the experience in building new communities and frankly the, the financial backing of uh, Philip Morris Company, um, which is the, now the largest consumer product corporation in, in the world, um, that was the backing for um, the development of, of Highlands Ranch and the purchase of Highlands Ranch, which by the way was $28 million um, and the a previous aforementioned owners, the Phipps family, bought it, um, sold it to some investors, including Marvin Davis. Marvin Davis Ventures. Uh, so it was um, uh, $14 million and 24 hours later, 20, so they doubled their money. Um, what an example of speculators, I'll tell you why. Sure. Um, but anyway, um, so that's the environment we're in and as it evolved into the rest of my many job responsibilities working on Highlands Ranch, I was the person that when the switchboard re received, you know, a, a, an upset person, they would send it to me because they knew, and I was trained to do this, and this was my job. They knew that I wouldn't, excuse my vernacular, piss them off. I, they knew I would listen carefully and respectfully, and they knew I could um, resolve the issue as best I could, if I could. Sometimes did, you can't. Did you work at the office over in Inverness? We worked at several offices, but the first one was in Inverness, correct. Mm -hmm. And after that? Well, we, we had, uh, let's see, we had offices along I-25 um, on to the west at uh, Arapahoe Road in I-25, a couple offices actually there. And then ultimately we built um, offices here in Highlands Ranch. Um, the first one being um, just to the west of here. Um, which is now owned by Visa Corporation. Um, but yeah, I mean, we wanted to seed our business parks by virtue of building buildings that we occupied. And Shea Center over here is another example. For a long time, Shea occupied that, but now others are hardly seeing it. So during your first year, year and a half, starting <coughs> January 78, mm -hmm. going through perhaps the end of 79, okay when the development plan mm -hmm. finally got approved by Douglas County mm -hmm. Planning Commission and then the commissions, the commissioners. What were the kind of things other than what you mentioned of answering the phone sure. uh, when somebody needed uh, their questions answered or their emotions smoothed out a bit or misunderstandings explained? What, what, are the, what other things were you doing from a planning point of view of putting together the development plan? So the key, yeah, you're right, what I described is not my key role, um, but my key role was to prepare the documents along with others, key documents that then were submitted to that, the Douglas County government uh, for purposes of processing and approval. The processing of those documents, what I mean by that is, is that it was sent out to 38 different referral agencies, agencies that might want to comment on this new city. And um, so I was involved in the processing of those on a daily basis, interacting with Douglas County planners, interacting with other 38 outside entities. Including Dr. Cog and right. other groups. And the, and the anecdote there, if I may share, is that the Dr. Cog, one of, one of the, well, Phil Riley, the president, God rest his soul, would, would um, say, he would review all these letters that are coming in about his project. And he took umbrage to this letter from Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. And one day I re recall him saying, who is this Dr. Cog and what right does he have to say anything about our project? <laughs> well, unfortunately he had it wrong, but that's, that's fine. And so I w was, along with others, don't get me wrong, I, there's a team here. Uh, I was responsible for uh, responding to those letters in writing saying, um, that's a great question or that's a great concern, here's what we're doing about it. And then they have the information then to evaluate as planners and or making ultimately recommendations to the decision making bodies. So, so that plus we had a series of maybe three dozen meetings with those same stakeholders, the same referral agencies. So it wasn't just me writing them a letter. We sat down with them. We face to face conversation because we felt that was the way to develop relationships, which is so important to successfully accomplish something like this. 
and these relationships have lasted for decades, mind you. And try to listen and then respond and then ask again, how do we do? What, what do you think of this response to your question? And invariably, not always, but largely it was a situation where it said, yeah, you listened to me, I'm happy that you did, and you responded. And I'm, so ultimately we kind of did a, a poll, right? Raise your hand if you support this. And they did, by and large. I'm told that uh, over the years there were many, many changes to the development plan and response to the process that you just talked about. Yes. And, and the changes to the plan over the years, and there's 77 currently, 77, uh, many of the changes over the years are in response to um, the market, the marketplace. In other words, what sells in the way of housing, because let's face it, the largest um, development portion in terms of what people interact with are the homes. And over time, home types and price ranges and lifestyles have changed dramatically in 40 years. Um, so many of those changes are a result of that. Other changes are somewhat unforeseen amenities, if you will, that we, you know, we knew we had the, the places for these things and we knew that we didn't have them all in mind. We couldn't have because some of the stuff that's come along wasn't even conceived of that we have now implemented into... Such, such as what? Well, um, uh, I have to think on that, but I think, uh, well, some of the extents of, of the various amenities surrounding, well, Civic Green Park is, is immediately out the window here. I don't know that we had that in our mind. Tanks Park for pickleball courts. Well, Who exactly. would have thought about at that point it wasn't even a sport then? Exactly, and thank yeah. you for that assistance. But I, you know, so that some of this, we knew we had it right. We had a town center, which by virtue of planning nomenclature was red, which is commercial on, on, on maps. We knew we had it, but we didn't have the details. And we knew without apology that that would come later. That would come, um, you know, we had to get the, the framework in place um, so that the plan could evolve. Mission Viejo was somewhat unique in the master plan developers to decide that when they put together the development plan that they would build the roads at the full capacity that would be needed over the life of the community. Here we are 40 years later, 100,000 plus people here, and yet the roads when they were first constructed were built at full capacity. Can you comment on why that was decided? Well, there are many reasons, um, so let me try to sort it out. First of all, it was um, in other communities, and in, in, um, for example, communities in Europe where you start with a buggy and then you have to accommodate technology that didn't, wasn't understood. We knew there would be automobiles, and that's uh, a fact, and we knew people had to use those roads uh, for the you know, using the automobile um, to get to and from. So we looked at we were had the, the the as a master developer. In other words, if if we were developing a part of Highlands Ranch and let's say a dozen other home builders did the same, they could build within the context of the approved plan. But the roads might have been narrower. We would have not known exactly what the expectation was. We knew that 40 years ago that Highlands Ranch would be what it is today. We knew that there would be 36,000 homes. We knew that there would be 100,000 people. Today, the 40th anniversary, that's happened. And that's probably Primarily because of the zoning that was yes. put together in the different zoning groups. Precisely. And that would determine the traffic on the roads and therefore the size of the roads and yep. the amenities that you also mentioned. That's exactly where right. Where they needed to be. Where did the schools need to be? Where did the library need to be? Where did the, the commercial properties? Planning. Everything else. It's planned. Yep. And we had the pleasure of planning it because we knew that we would be in charge, the master developer. One, I mean, it's so easy. 
we were in charge. Yes, the government approved everything, but we had the vision from day one of what this place would be. How important was the finances of the corporate parent to allow you to build at capacity roads? Concrete's expensive. It was, it was critical. And in the early stages, um, we, we had to create those. So in other parts of the country, the local government or the city, but typically in this case it would be the county, and that the county would finance the infrastructure, meaning roads and sewer and water. We had to create those entities because Douglas County didn't do that. The only community facility that they built at the time uh, was regional parks, just that niche. We had to create an entity to build all the parks. We had Douglas County School District, so we knew that they had that covered, but we had to create essentially a, a city district, a municipal district called Highlands Ranch Metro to build many facilities. We also went with the model of a homeowner, Master Homeowners Association, Highlands Ranch Community Association, which at the time was the largest in the nation in terms of you know, numbers of members, etc. And so we got the, the community in, investment involving other entities as well. We created the financing structure through the metro district, through taxation of the residents. So we were able to spread the cost over the residents' taxes. But where there was a shortfall, and mind you, when you start something like this, there's a huge shortfall. There's another issue, growth paying its own way. We set up initially the Metropolitan District financing to include a contribution from the developer, oops, <laughs> contribution from the developer called system development fees that we paid per household towards the cost of this. So we had a financing structure, we had subsidy, and the first municipal bonds and, and several years thereafter, it took a while to have the Metropolitan District receive an A rating in Standard & Poor's. In order to get them approved, the bonds, Mission Viejo Company and its parent company, Philip Morris, in fact, guaranteed the bonds. That, that doesn't happen, but in this case it did, and it was critical to have that financial foundation. And now, I mean, I think it was several years ago, three years ago, the bonds are paid off. All the bonds are paid off. Who does that? Who can do that? But we're a finite community. We're a finite obligation. All the infrastructure, by and large, is built um, forever. Now we're in a mode of maintaining it and replacing it, all yep. of those things. But, um, I, you know, this is the vision of somebody that knows what they're doing. The master plan community developer with the financial resources and a team of individuals that are experienced and knowledgeable of how to get this done. Um, there's others I don't want to mention for, for logical reasons that don't have that knowledge, expertise, or financing. And they're struggling, and as you might expect, here in Douglas County. Yep. So, at some point in the 80s, you <clears throat> left the employment of Jack Robb mm -hmm. and were employed by Mission Viejo? So the answer to that is Mission Viejo Company bought. They bought Jack, Jack Robb Company. Okay. When um, did that occur? Well, mid-80s. I think it was 85, if I remember correctly. And did your responsibilities change at all? Not really. No. Yeah. It was a seamless. I mean, we are attached at the hip, right? So that continued on. Right. But in the late 80s, Mission Viejo made a strategic decision. Yeah, instead of being primarily the exclusive home builder, in addition to the community developer, to change their focus. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. So uh, they were the community developer and builder and home builder for a time. And then they started the process of involving other home builders. And in order to develop a community, an entity, whatever, has to be uh, able to do the infrastructure um, development, the, the engineering, we use outside consultants, but engineering and then f f uh, construction of actual roads, 
that aren't the arterials operated by the metro district, but the local streets and you know, putting in the sewer and putting all the things you can think of that create what's called a finished lot. This is a lot that could be sold or could be kept by the developer. In this case, it was Mish Veo and then later Shea Homes. It could be um, kept and a house built on that has the developer's name on it. So we were uniquely qualified in doing that development but then we realize it's much more profitable and you know hit our sweet core values of about development to have a product that then others can be involved um, and I think at one point we had 18 different home builders um, buying lots from us I mean we would plan it we would design it and we would do it based on their specifications in other words what do you want to build builder do you want to build mansions? Do you want to build townhomes and everything in between? And that would be subject to zoning. Well, truly, but the zoning, yes. So they, they would locate it. They would say, I want to come to you and buy lots in this specification, they used to call it. Um, uh, the average house is 5,000 square foot lot. That's the average, average, average. So we want, let's say, hypothetically, we, would, we want 5,000 square foot lots. And so where can we build it? By and large, to your point, anywhere that it's zone residential would fit that, but not everywhere. And so we did have some, um, my father-in-law was in the shoe business. You had to find fit, a shoe that fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that going forward, we were totally in the um, lot sale business, as well as continuing our process of developing other amenities in the community that were needed. And by the way, this is not altruistic. This is good business. We created the things that would attract people to move here, to live here. And that helps sell homes. So parenthetically, the buyers of these lots, that, the finished lots, knew that we would have their back, that we would create a community that would be attractive enough that it made their job of selling their homes easier. I've talked to a number of people over the years who talked about the early role of the Activities Committee, which was patterned after what Mission Viejo Company had done very successfully in California, in Mission Viejo, and I suspect also in Alyssa Viejo. Mm -hmm. That's true. Talk about how important that was to create the type of amenities in the community mm -hmm. and the sense of community <clears throat> that would encourage people to take a flyer and move far out from Denver into what had been prairie land on an old cattle ranch. It was critical. Um, you know, if you're a home builder and you, I mean, you want to build a home, or sell homes, I should say, that's all you care about. But if you're a developer and a master plan development, and, and you care about sustaining the attractiveness and the um, ability to create community. And yes, again, I, I must say, in all honesty, it's not altruistic, it's good business. Um, but uh, I'm very proud of, of how the folks involved in Highlands Ranch have created a true community. By the way, I raised my family here. So not only do I speak it, I've lived it. It's not hypothetical to me. Um, it's so you remember um, the first soapbox derby? I do, I do. And I remember the announcer, Jeff Kappas, you know, yeah. all of this. So, <clears throat> and I'm sure you remember um, perhaps in the first few years where they invited the public to come out for spring uh, calf branding. I do. What an experience that was. Yeah. The, the, uh, I'm not a rancher. I had no experience until I became an employee, and to smell burnt hide was something I'll never forget. Yeah. <laughs> as well as the young people that experienced that. Sure. And the families. And of course, you've experienced more than you can count the number of Fourth of July parades. Yes, yes. And many of these things came from California. Exactly. Or Santa's workshops. Whatever exactly. It be, exactly. That good ideas were brought forward because they belonged to the same corporate mm -hmm. entity, and, and they, what had worked in California most of the time worked here. And they evolve, yeah. 
and they are delegated now, if I can use that word to, you know, metro district and community association as well. So we used to have a staff member on Mission Vale staff that would do that. And we do have somebody that coordinates, you know, our involvement because frankly we, we're philanthropic and we do help fund some of these things like we pay for the fireworks and, you know, those kinds of things. Again, to be involved in our community. But uh, we have delegated that to and cultivated leadership within the community of both employees of those entities I just mentioned and volunteers. Many, many volunteers are involved in making this place great. And God bless them. So in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, started a tremendous growth pattern within Highlands Ranch. Population shot up from 17,000 to in the high 80s or whatever it was at that point because of opening up, as you said, good business opportunity for other people to build homes, amenities being developed in the planning process and having the community zoned and planned to accommodate that at that point. 1996 or 1997, uh, Mission Philip Morris decides to sell the Mission Viejo company, including the property here in Colorado. Tell us about how you were affected by that decision at that point. Well, I thought it a wise decision because, let's face it, a consumer product-oriented business, this is not their core business. And it was plainly evident. Of course, they told us that's their reason, but of course. Um, uh, when we last talked about this, 1996, I believe, was the year that Mich Philip Morris decided to sell the Mission Viejo Company and all their properties, not only here in Colorado, but also in Arizona and California. How were you affected, and how you became a Shea employee, I, I take it? Correct. And how did that change direction under the leadership of Shea Homes? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I think that the decision by Philip Morris to do that was um, maybe brilliant. Uh, in other words, home building and master plan community development, while well, they had a good run, definitely, no question about it, it's not their core business. They're the world's largest consumer product corporation. And yes, I guess homes are a consumer product, but it isn't Cheese Whiz and all the other products that are, you know, and unfortunately tobacco and beer. But um, I think that they had a good run and it was a good, good time to make a change. And I couldn't be more happy with the entity that they selected to, to purchase it and you know they got good money but it was a, was a company that was family run the Shays you know multi-generational company they had uh, their history is extraordinary they had the Shays were involved in construction of Hoover Dam Hoover Dam so they were part one of the seven the Golden Gate Bridge correct correct I mean extraordinary Pretty big project and, and have, they, they started out as a heavy construction company. They did the reverse curve bore in Glenwood Canyon, you know, so they have local experience, but uh, they had a reputation. And because they were family and they had principal and they had all the things that you could want mm -hmm. in a corporate entity, um, it was, it, not only was it seamless transition, I was still doing what I was always doing, not only was it seamless, I, and again, no disrespect to my prior tradition or employer, I, I think it was in many respects better. Um, one of the first things that the president, well, then president, um, and now the new president, Bert Selva, have, have started and continue, their job first, first day was to create a culture. And that culture was, you were, we were all respected. We expected, respected each other. Um, and it was just astonishing. We were all kind of giddy um, with, with what has transpired, while at the same time continuing to work. But it inspired us to do even better and even more. Did most of the employees who had been out here employed by Mission Viejo Company go over to Shea? Yes. Well, I mean, most. honestly, you had, you had a, a, well, not everybody was given an offer. 
right? So there were some, there was some attrition, but by and large, everybody that was offered took the offer, and uh, it was very generous. I won't go into details, but extremely generous. Yeah. So how did the direction change? Certainly, we know that a few years later, town hall got built and commercial expanded and a few things like that. What else? How did the direction change? I have to say the direction changed with the leadership in terms of what their personal goals were. Let me give you an example. Later on in the development, that country, um, which, which was branded by Shea Holmes as the last great place. So there was, there was, they were very aware that there was an end to the development. Up until then, we were, you know, Every day we're making it, making it, and once we got to yeah, that, yeah, yeah, basically. and we we're just doing our business. Not that it was that boring, but it was great. But so there was an awareness that there's going to be an end, and let's make it great. Let's let's take what's happened and improve upon it. Was their mission, their their vision? So as I mentioned, the example of uh, backcountry, um, you know, the leadership of Shea Holmes at the time. Um, were keenly interested in golf. So they had an ambition, an appetite. Let's do a really nice Jack Nicholas golf course. And that would be the amenity that would add value to the lots in backcountry. So they're, these are large lot by and large, and there's some smaller, but this is to be the best community in Highlands Ranch. The land that the backcountry was built on, was that part of the original development plan or was it added later on? The backcountry geography, if you will, the planning area in our nomenclature was in fact part of the original. It was modified to incorporate as much of the plan. One of the 77 amendments is, is um, as, as the late Jerry Poston, uh, my, my boss at the time, said, we would take the boundaries of the development areas and we ooch and scooch them, which means we would modify those boundaries to fit the land better. I mean, keep in mind, this was a general plan. It wasn't a specific plan in 1979. So we would ooch and scooch, why? Well, let's be honest. If you wanna make money, you have homes backing up on to open space. That's what this place is about, open space. So we modified the boundaries so more homes could back up into open space. That's what happened in backcountry. We, we ooched and scooched it, so we left more of the drainages. Rather than putting drainage water into a pipe and filling over and putting housing on, we left it natural. And so that natural drainage allowed for more frontage for homes to back onto, and it's just a better plan. So those are the amendments that we went through over time. And yes, we had to justify them to the local government, but they, thought, they saw the merit of it. Um, but the, to my point earlier, um, so there was an ambition by the new leadership to have certain amenities that weren't envisioned by the old leadership. And when did the backcountry planning process start? Um, well, actually it went on for years. Um, went on for eight years, I'm not exactly, I think it was in the early 2000s. So it wasn't the first thing oh, that no. they ended up working with. But again, these people typically tend to have a, a long view. Yeah, exactly. Things. Exactly. So but see, I, I stepped ahead a bit just for illustrative purposes. Yes. So we got to the point of ready to execute and you know, you do the performa, which is, can we afford this and is it going to make money? And so as part of that process, we had a focus group. And the focus group said, I'm not going to pay for a Jack Nicholas. I don't see the value of it. So the people of Highlands Ranch did not have share the same ambition as Bert Selva. And again, no casting, no dispersions, but we learned, we learned something. We learned that there was more value to these folks because of what had transpired over the prior three decades, that people value the open space. So we set out to create a private enclave of open space just for them, not for the rest of the community, just for them. And then we had the Sundial House, which is, I had a hand in, in designing and researching for and whatever, wonderful process, very satisfying to me personally. The that's, Sundial- That's the clubhouse. That's the, the clubhouse. Country. So it would have been the golf house, 
So see the transition? Yeah. It's no longer a golf house, which has the amenities that golf course oriented communities have, but this is an open space place and it's designed, the pools and everything else in it is designed as a resort, this resort like feel. So it's like you would go to your favorite vacation spot in your own community, in your own backyard. So I think, again, you, you can see I'm excited about it. I, I don't live there, but I, if I could afford it, I would. Uh, but that's a part of the change of the leadership, the new leadership. And to their credit, they didn't rest on their laurels. They did it right and figured out what would work. You mentioned you worked for Jerry Poston. I did. That's the same Poston as in Poston Parkway? It is, exactly. And uh, he has a... Yeah. He has a street named after him on the south side of the community. Correct. And the late Joe Blake is the water plant because he had a key hand in making sure we had the water we needed. So, I mean, that's his legacy. Sure. He also has a street named after him yeah. near the RTD section because exactly. he had a role in getting some of the, the key portions of having Highlands Ranch have their own uh, postal code. Uh, and, Littleton. and there would not be an RTD bus in Highlands Ranch if it weren't for him. Correct. Yeah, he had a lot of things to do, and uh, he's, among other people, people who had great influence on lots of decisions of what the community is like today. I consider him a mentor. I had the honor of working for him for decades. Mm -hmm. well, you said you worked for him. Tell me about And with that. him. Tell me how... How you interacted with Joe? So part of my role with the company was to, uh, and he, this was his responsibility for a long, long time and, and continued to be, we would work with the Colorado legislature. And in, in that, we would uh, actually work with legislators to draft bills, draft legislation to improve the law that might impede our ability to do good things in this community. I don't have an example, but um, so we did that, and, and I was his, uh, I was his shadow in that regard, and then that evolved into me working with a lobbyist that was under contract with with Shea Holmes to, you know, manage the process to try and get approval of this legislation, as well as good business sense, right? Protect the interest of the business, as all businesses do in legislative setting, by maybe seeking amendments to legislation to make it less onerous on the home building industry, the development industry, while um, recognizing the merits of the legislation. And so my role was to sit down with legislators, with the lobbyists, and work through all those processes. Um, fascinating, just fascinating process. This is the, I've heard the term entitlements used. Is this what you're referring to? Well, entitlements is more um, uh, a term that's used for approval of zonings and, and approval of projects and that kind of things. Um, working with the legislature on the things that I just spoke to was, well, maybe protecting the entire entitlements, it, uh, protecting what we've worked so hard to do and not uh, the expression is, is that um, um, uh, unintended consequences of a piece of legislation. That was our role. That was my role. That was Joe Blake's role to point out to the drafters that this is all well and good. And I know you had the best intentions, but did you consider this? And if you modified it ever so slightly, you can avoid this unintended consequence of the legislation. And again, I'm very proud of that. It's not uh, underhanded or con uh, conspiratorial or any of that. I think it was an interesting facet. And I never thought in my career I'd be involved in things like that. That's how my career evolved. Good. So in the late uh, <clears throat> 1990, 2000 timetable, mm -hmm. Town Center mm -hmm. kind of got fleshed out a bit. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your involvement was with that. That so, was dramatically different than mm -hmm. what had been built in Highlands Ranch before, where the majority of the housing stock had been single-family units, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, 
we have townhouses mm -hmm. and communities of townhouses being planned mm -hmm. and built and executed. Mm -hmm. um, so my role in that was to do a lot of research, use my education in planning, uh, and apply um, all the new principles that were out there. We were aware that, okay, Highlands Ranch is a suburban master plan community. We're not downtown Denver. We're not high rise, you know, in, in Rhino District has evolved to be a very dense community. We're not that. However, most people don't know that the original plan in 1979 has these planning areas with the specific prescription of homes that could be Rhino. In other words, what is the market? Yes or no. We could always go back and, and make some modifications. But one third, and today there's 6,000 of the 36,000, so it's not a huge percentage of multifamily houses. And so initially we could have had up to one third of the 36,000 be high density. So it wasn't not thought of, it was thought of and it was incorporated and it was part of the original plan because we knew as the needs changed, as the community matures, I, I'm turning 70 in August, my needs have changed, I'm thinking of downsizing. So we always knew the evolution of community over time would be such that there would be a market and an appetite for that. So I must correct you that the town center wasn't the first. There had been for a couple of decades actually before then, some of that scattered about, um, but this was the first brownstone intentionally a design um, that was mimicked New York City or any city. The town center itself went through a, um, I believe it was a 10 year process, which I love. I mean, I was planning and it was a team, right? And, and Shea Properties implements the commercial. That's a different subset company. And a colleague there at Shea Properties was the inspiration for the New England motif. And you'll notice, for example, one of the streets in the town center is Dorchester. He, he grew up in Dorchester. Interesting. Um, yeah. And the, there's another town. Anyway, um, the clock tower has inspiration in a New England town. And I've got a you know, picture of it. Anyway. Um, so there's a lot of that, okay, what do we think of when we want to have a downtown? Largely, we have this desire to go back to historical downtowns that we've visited, Savannah, Georgia, I don't know where, but lots of people connect with that rather than this something different. So we wanted to have some of the ingredients of what people remember uh, as, as a town they grew up in or a town that they admired here. Um, and so, yes, there's a mix of, of land uses that's found nowhere, nowhere else in the community, intentionally. And so out the window is the Civic Green Park. That is the Brownstones Park. Yeah. But it also yeah. functions as many other things. And so all of these things came together after years of, of cogitation to what it is today. And the library I mentioned earlier, I think it's just um, a brilliant thing. So I'm very proud of it in terms of my role in it, but there were planners and designers, and I mentioned Shea Properties leadership, you know, executed it. I didn't execute it, but uh, just wonderful. The community has grown <clears throat> over the years. Primary growth rate had been in the 90s. It's continued, though it's slowed down and it's now almost capacity at this point. It's nearing what we call maturation. Yeah. Mature. Yeah. We started with just one rec center at Northridge mm -hmm. in the early days of the 80s of the community. That was the first mm -hmm. real draw mm -hmm. of the area, plus then the elementary school, and then others were added later on as the community developed. What role did you have in terms of the planning process of where to put some of these things. I understand the fourth rec center, there was some uh, debate about where that should be sited. Mm -hmm. So my role, um, I mean, some of the decision making was not mine, um, but my role was to try and find a combination of, as you say, interests that were 
posing its location and find a suitable location that satisfied the interests of, of the residents. So no, we didn't, you know, we had a master plan and, and we implemented it by and large as is, but sure, on the fourth one, somehow there was a different point of view. Did we anticipate it? Probably not, but that's the beauty of being um, a developer um, wherein you're, you're not opposed to making changes. In other words, we, we Shea Homes, could have rammed it down the people's throat and not given a, a hoot. But that's not the way we do business, and that's certainly not to, a way to sell homes in the future. If you get a bad reputation, or if somebody complains about, and, and that's true in business, if somebody doesn't like your, your customer service, they tell 17 people, I'm told. Right. And you don't need that. Yep. You, you know, it's hard to overcome that. But um, I, my role in that is to get, again, the entitlements. I got them approved. The land was... was what they call platted, legally created lot for these facilities. And I was the one that sat down with the county planners and, and the, you know, the entities providing the Highlands Ranch Community Association. So on their behalf, I was involved as a representative of that then landowner, Shea Holmes, owned the land. And I was the one that took it all the way to re recordation of the deed. I didn't do the transactional, others did that, in other words, conveying it and all the contracts that associate with that. But I had my hand in all of the, you know, everything. I had my hand in 27 schools. Did I design them? Did I build them? Did I? No. But I worked with the people that did, and I planned for them. I served on the school district long-range planning committee from 1980 to 2008. And boy, did I learn. I, I was the developer representative. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may anecdote, um, the interesting thing about that experience was I was merely the voice of, the, of then the fastest growing community in Douglas County School District. And, and rightfully so, that's where the growth was. And rightfully so, that's where the schools were needed. And towards the end of the process, others were involved in this. I mean, they they'd had three year terms and some of them got reinstated. It's a, they're all volunteers. One of them I remember said, why are we even here? Steve's got, he's the puppeteer and he's, he's directing all this. And uh, no, I didn't take umbrage to it, but I remember it because it was totally untrue. This is where the need was and it happened. And uh, in the meantime, I, I knew all the ins and outs of how schools were designed and planned and built and funding. And I just learned an enormous amount, again, thanks to my employer because these were night meetings every month for all those years. But I then translated that when I kind of left Shea Homes and started my own private consulting firm. I translated that into the institutional knowledge I had was invaluable to the school district. So I made yet another career, if you will, by being employed as an independent contractor to the school district in assisting with planning for the future school. And this was in the late first decade of the 2000s. 2008. Yeah. That's when I when I moved on and for 14 years that's been my I'm a I'm a business of one. I understand. And uh, and I my last day with that business will occur on the 13th of June. Yes. I have days days left in that yeah. endeavor. Indeed. One of the areas of Highlands Ranch that people think about is the land surrounding the Highlands Ranch mansion and the mansion building itself and the headquarters <coughs> surrounding buildings at this point. Its use has changed mm -hmm. over the years when mm -hmm. it was acquired as part of the original $28 million purchase mm -hmm. at this point. Any stories you'd like to tell of your dealings with the Highlands Ranch Mansion? Mm -hmm. um, well, let me, let me jump forward to last Sunday. I'm, I'm going to get emotional. Before this, my involvement in the Highlands Ranch Mansion was initially one of 
what, what, what is this asset? What is this potential thing? What, what are we going to do with it? And so during the process, in fact, one of my colleagues that made me think about last Sunday, one of my colleagues, which has been a 42 year, year run as a best friend, was the first person from Mission Vale Company to enter the mansion. He got the key and he reported back to management what he found. It was, it was like Indiana Jones or the discoverer of to King Tut's tomb. What's in this place? So he went in the attic and found all these treasures that the Phipps family has simply left. Things like, you know, historic photos, which have now been published, etc. But, I mean, a large picture of, of the mansion in 1928, you know, just glorious artifacts. And he crawled in the basement. I've never been in the basement. The basement's uh, 36 inches. So you literally have to crawl through the whole, you know, imagine that underneath it's, the It's hole. a low ceiling, yeah. And so um, throughout my career, it was a place, a beloved place, as an asset to Mishmael Company, where corporate functions occurred. In other words, every year there would be a corporate Christmas party for the employees, as well as for the, some employees like me who uh, worked with other entities where we would invite people, frankly, that we wanted to influence to the mansion for a Christmas party or other occasions, other events. So I was in, involved in all of those meetings for an extended period of time. So I, I don't know, I've probably been in corporate events and meetings and parties um, in the 300 range there. So it's part of my life. Most yeah. of them prior to the renovation in 2012. Precisely. Precisely. And uh, when <laughs> I have an anecdotal story. So when the Shays acquired Highlands Ranch, like so, occurs so many times, they're, they're in the atmosphere with all the huge decisions to be made. Where, how are we going to finance this acquisition? How are we, the details are not, not involved, which is fine. And that's to be expected. But here we go. And I mentioned uh, recently Jeff, um, Jeff Cabot. So Jeff's as a vice president, gave a tour of the mansion to the Shays, the family, the Shea family. And John Shea said, this is a lovely building. He says to Jeff, who owns it? Jeff says, you do. <laughs> and, you know, his eyes got big. And I mean, I mean, that's the nature of things. But, um, but anyway, so for many, many years, and, and Subsequent to my employee with Shea Holmes as, as an independent contractor, I was invited back to, and I'm very grateful because of my involvement and my role, I was in back, invited back to actually hand the key, if you will, over to the Metropolitan District. So I was in that ceremony. This was 2009? I believe that's right. Yes, yes. And so here are the, the then pre, you know, uh, executive team of Shea Holmes and me. There are a lot of pictures in front of the carved door there. Yeah, exactly. And that's this, yeah. that's the one. And uh, so again, thank thank you, Shea Holmes, for allowing me to have you know they're showing me the dignity of my involvement over the years. I can't thank him enough. So back to Sunday. And maybe this is too personal, but let me share it anyway. This month. This summer is a confluence of huge milestones in my life and my family's life. I turned 70. My wife and I both retire from multi-decade careers. My eldest son, married in pandemic, had his wedding party Sunday with 120 people. Private event. Private event. We, we bought essentially for a night the mansion, catered lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, I can't, I can't think of a more um, perfect venue. And what? Here's the capper. My wife and I celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary in July. And it is there at a Philip Morris corporate event that I met her. A lot of history there. Wow. Right on the lawn. Yeah. Big round table. Here's suit, suit and tie corporate executives from New York, 
They had just purchased at the time a Gulfstream jet with 20 passengers, not a Learjet, a big... Anyway, so they flew out from New York, landed at Centennial Airport, had their limousines take us to this party. It was themed Western, so they all had their cowboy hats. Picture this, not a suit, cowboy hats. You know, they were uncomfortable in their newly purchased cowboy boots. Yeah. Um, coming to a Western barbecue, so it was, you know, meat on the spit, right? And uh, lovely night, and I met my wife. What year is this? Um, 1981, September 3rd. Yeah. Did Art Cook do the barbecue? I believe he did. He was. We, we he used was to known for that. We used to we used to call Art Golden Throat because he spoke. Yeah. I mean, he <clears throat> was it. He has a. He doesn't have a face for radio, but he's a very handsome man. But he was also known for his pit barbecues yeah. in the backyard. And he is a, uh, was a, a wonderful uh, cowboy. I mean, he, he was authentic in his appearance. He always wore the hat and all that. So he was the perfect, and he gave the Philip Morris team the tour of the property. And this was, you know, with Michelle, but um, just what memories, what and what part of my life? Oh, wonderful you could do a, an event at the mansion uh, because of its significance to you and your family. Exactly. Yeah. And the restoration. I mean, I don't, I mean, the general public that will be seeing this, mm -hmm. they really need to take the opportunity, the free opportunity that occurs from time to time and visit this place. Most of the people at my party had never been. Wow. Why would they, right? They were from other parts of the country, other parts of the city, sure. and there wasn't a reason to do so. And they were, I mean, I got the credit. This is wonderful. It's not my house. Yeah. But I, I, I joke with them. I said, well, we're going to, we own this tonight. We're going to close on it on Monday. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I had an opportunity to work with um, Jeff Case mm -hmm. and interview him at one point of all the decisions went into the 18-month process of remodeling the mansion, mm -hmm. design criteria and those things. You had a question about, or a, a statement of what, what you think was most um, interesting about Jeff Case? Well, I, Jeff is uniquely qualified to do the restoration. Um, he, his attention to detail, his respect for history. I mean, I can go on and on about his attributes that made it what it is. And uh, if there's a legacy there, well, I'm it, told it, he also has 30,000 pictures that date back to yeah. 1981 he does. of the facility. And, and he's, he's created an archive. It, I don't know its um, disposition, but it's my understanding it's part of you know, your archive, perhaps. But anyway, long story short, he has taken upon himself to document uh, beautifully a huge part of the history of Highlands Ranch, and some of which are his personal photography. Um, but I mean, there's no no better example of someone that loves and respects Highlands Ranch. Good. Who else in the, your dealings in the 40 plus years in Highlands Ranch um, have you respected the most? Would like to comment upon? Well, I think we've covered a lot of a lot of those, um, but I mean. I think that I would have to say that you know folks like Shea, uh, uh, Shea Holmes president Bert Selva was a huge influence on me and, and uh, largely uh, you know I, he, all of the folks I work for showed me the utmost respect, the utmost um, consideration and tried to tailor my job responsibilities to what my gifts were and my interests. And quite frankly, the reason I've stayed all these years, you know, 50 year career, imagine that. The reason I've stayed in one, one way or another with this organization and the development team is because they always gave me something new, a new challenge to, I mean, it wasn't static, it wasn't boring, it, every day was different. And no one, I mean, I, I don't talk to anybody that really feels that that's the way that their career or their current job or whatever is. You know, what were your most uh, challenging assignments? 
Well, if you had to pick your top three. I'll pick one. The, the biggest challenge I have is, and it took me a while to realize that, um, and it's, I alluded to it earlier, is the public reaction to this. This is my baby. This is, I mean, yes, there's others, other parents for sure, but I tell you, um, I'll defend Highlands Ranch and the companies that build it forever. And, you know, most of my interactions with the public that might say something that I consider snarky, <laughs> they're just talking, and I understand that. And I'm not, I'm not saying they don't have the right to have a point of view and express it. I'm not saying that at all. I just wish they take the time to learn what it is. I, I bristle when somebody says, eh, that's just sprawl. Well, by definition, sprawl is unplanned community. It's not even a community, it's unplanned development. This place called Highlands Ranch is as it was envisioned 40 years ago. And you can't say it's unplanned sprawl. Yes, it takes up land, but wait a minute, folks. Most people don't know that 61% of the land is open space. And it's that open space that I'm the most proud of. And guess what? Nobody knows about it. That's okay. You know, I'm just proud of it anyway because of going back into grade school and going back into university. I was all about the environmental movement. I wanted to protect the land. And to have this, I have a plaque up by Sundell House that says, you know, Thank you for creating the vision of Highlands Ranch and, and making it reality. Well, my plaque is facing what? The open space. Because leadership knew that that was as much as anything. And there's another example. I came back out of unemployment from Shea Holmes. They called me back to make the presentation. I mentioned the mansion of the open space to the Highlands Ranch Community Association. They honored me by being the face of this transaction. And of course they were beside me, but again, I can't thank them enough. And by the same token, I'm very proud of, of that um, effort. And so I've been blessed with the opportunity to be part of the legacy of Highlands Ranch. Well, I think that's a good summary, and we want to thank you on behalf of the Historical Society for sharing your thoughts of all the things that you did to make this community what it is today that we're all quite proud of. Thank you. It's been an honor.